Hi, welcome back to Rogue Tech, and welcome back to your first playthrough. So, uh, as I mentioned at the end of the last video, we are going to be building the Lamb Urbimnik, and we're also going to be upgrading the Argo. But first, um, I did some modifications to uh, the sound of the videos, and uh, yeah, just if you could, if you're, you know, if you like or dislike the difference, or if you can't even tell the difference from this video and yesterday's video, Please leave me a comment so I know. Um, I'm always trying to make things just a little bit better here and there. So, with that out of the way, let's get into it. We're going to immediately, before I forget, because I'm a goldfish on occasion, go into the ship upgrade section of engineering. And we're going to look, and we're going to see what we want to do. Now, training modules is very interesting. And that's usually exactly what I would do without even thinking about it after second mech bay and automation, or possibly before automation, maybe even before second mech bay, depending on how far we're traveling the first, uh, the first couple financial reports or whatever. But I went ahead and decided we'll go ahead and look at some of the other options and how they pertain, especially after the handheld rework. Because training modules might not be the right answer for you anymore. Although, it is just objectively good. Uh, reduces affinity decay, so you can swap between pilots without having to worry too much about uh, about their affinity decreasing, like when you travel or whatever. And it does give passive experience every day that passes. Um, <laughs> so, it may not sound like a lot when it says 30 experience per day, but keep in mind, that's uh, 900 experience per financial report as long as they're not injured, whether they're fatigued or not, just as long as they're not injured, like that's a full mission. Every financial report for free. <laughs> like that's, that's substantial in any case. So what would we do if we weren't going to do training modules? So just for reference, training modules, one of the things that makes it such a really good early buy, it only costs 90,000. It only takes 10 days. And it only adds just under 700 C-bills to your financial report every month. That's pretty solid for what you're getting. Um, but in your particular given situation, you may benefit from something more like recreation here. Now, until you upgrade to get the lounge and Habitat Pods B and uh, or Beta and Gamma, you... That is Gamma, right? Yeah. Um... <laughs> Just glancing at the, uh, I don't know, Greek symbol or whatever. And yeah. Any, anyway, uh, all that aside. So, the benefit of getting morale upgrades. Uh, before the handheld rework, it didn't really matter that much. Like, yes, it influenced how much resolve you built up every round. But not too much. And also, you usually had enough to use Vigilance when you needed it, and use uh, Offensive Push when you needed it. But now that everything is on a per-pilot basis, or per mech warrior, having the extra morale is actually kind of really important, because now instead of you gathering enough resolve to use Vigilance once in the first couple rounds of combat, even with really low morale, now it's going to take the entire battle, if not like make it impossible to use vigilance at any point during the battle if your individual mech warriors don't have any way of developing resolve other than morale and as we saw whenever we were hovering during the financial report um pretty sure pretty sure future me made a notation whenever i hovered the wrong thing but if your morale is underneath 20 you lose resolve every round so it literally will be impossible for you to use any of your uh, skill level 9 perks. Uh, or is it 8? I think it's 8. In any case, the, the higher tier perks all require resolve now. So you won't be able to use any of them if you have morale under 20 ever. Unless you have plenty of ways to offset the minus 1 per turn or per round. Um, and yeah getting to 20 or higher gives you one per round so it's a delta of two but more importantly you're building it up instead of losing uh so the other ways to get resolve other than morale is 
getting kills, uh, destroying components, making enemies, uh, you know, punch out, etc., etc., etc. Just all, all the good things that you could possibly do that makes your battle win. <laughs> oh man, English. Uh, like anything that gets you closer to victory uh, basically generates positive morale, and anything that gets you closer to defeat generally generates negative morale or resolve. Whatever. The two systems are intertwined, so... Resolve is in combat, morale is out of combat. Morale influences resolve, resolve does not influence morale. There. Now I said it. Now I can stumble over my words the rest of the time. If you have morale below 10, you're losing 2 per round. 2 resolve. Gone. Per round. So even if you're consistently getting kills and things and destroying components with one mech warrior, they still might not get a chance to use, like, anything the entire battle meanwhile if you manage to get up to 30 or higher you're gaining three base resolve per round now keep in mind once you get your resolve gauge halfway you're also gaining one ecm shield and probe if i recall correctly what it said uh We'll look when we're in mission, but yeah. And then uh, if you get above 40, it's five per turn or per, five per round. I say, I keep saying per turn because it's like per turn of that individual mech warrior, but yeah, because each mech can only, each mech or vehicle can only act once per round. So the only confusion would be like per turn would kind of also mm, sort of pot potentially mean teammates turns, but in this context, I was meaning like per turn of that individual mech warrior or vehicle, or mech or vehicle. In any case, <laughs> all that aside, um, so morale, especially after the handheld rework, is very, very interesting to invest into. Mech tech, honestly, once you have mech bay 2 and uh, automation upgraded, there are higher priorities, like almost everything is a higher priority compared to getting one tech point, and then this is another one tech point. But here's the thing, after you get the uh, the lounge, you can get other tech point up, or not, uh, that's morale. Uh, actually, did they, maybe, medical points, morale, morale, medical points, there we go. Uh, you can get some tech points while you're also getting morale and medical points with the higher morale upgrades. And so it could actually be very beneficial to pursue the morale upgrades to unlock the other morale upgrades. Or, as I mentioned briefly, uh, getting to beta pod sooner to upgrade, uh, to give yourself more morale upgrades that you have access to, as well as giving you an additional eight mech warriors. So if somebody gets injured, if somebody, you know, for whatever reason can't drop or you'd rather drop with a different set of skills, whatever the case may be, having beta pod lets you hire and have more mech warriors that are also going to train more. It is worth noting, do not forget, every additional mech warrior or pilot you hire does increase your financial reports substantially, especially the more skills they develop. So beta pause is a massive investment. It's 900,000 up front. And then, you know, in addition to the 3,400, which is kind of whatever for the financial reports, you're also, you know, paying extra for every mech warrior you hire. But obviously if you're gonna do that, you need to repair, what was it, structure? Uh, yeah, structural repair. And structural repair is only 85,000 in 15 days. So you can very much, instead of going for training modules, you can go towards beta pod faster. That said, uh, trading module's pretty good. <laughs> um, power system does give morale and tech points, so it's also a viable upgrade for morale uh, in case you want to kind of split between the two. It also goes towards unlocking future upgrades. Uh, drop information is new, as far as I understand it, to handheld rework, and it just gives you more information before you commit to a mission. So, uh, yeah, you can see what kind of terrain you're dropping on, and then drop information too, which requires improved power conduits, uh, enables weather preview. So you'll be able to see if you're dropping at night, you'll be able to see if you're dropping in, you know, uh, whatever conditions fog or whatever that might interfere with your ability to you know execute or it might 
it might change what mechs and vehicles you plan on bringing. For example, if if there is a nighttime mission and you only have some of your mechs with night vision, congratulations, you now know if it's a night mission, don't drop the mechs that don't have night vision. Ta-da! But that said, a lot of this can just be ignored early game. Like, the terrain... Whenever you're dropping on, I'd say anything less than a five skull mission, you don't really care what the terrain is. Just bring a you know decent assortment of things and deal with whatever you come across. It, it is also a very hefty investment. Not so much the first one, but the second one. Um, but like that's an option. If you if you if you're developing very very specialized mechs like. Some people like the long-range shenanigans of, you know, dropping artillery and indirect fire on the enemies until they all die from it. It might be beneficial, if you're trying for that playstyle, to go for the terrain mapping sensor. In which case, you can tell if your shenanigans are going to work or not. And then, other than upgrading towards the habitat pod, um, getting some mech tech or morale or both training pods, the last thing to consider is the commands control. Or command and, command and control. Drop size. This is the thing you have to buy first if you want to drop more units of any kind in a single mission. It's 2.5 million sea bills, but it only takes one day. If you have a large, large surplus of sea bills, just, you know, in case you maybe started with a lot more initial funding. This could be a pretty valuable early pickup, especially since it only takes one day. Uh, it'll let you drop two additional battle armor, and it'll unlock... No, not leopard stores. Um... Uh, yeah? No. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, here we go. It'll let you unlock Vehicle Drop Bay 1, which is 300,000 sea bills and six days. Or... The Repair Drop Bay 1 enables to drop one additional mech or tank. Or both! So, in half a financial report, six days, plus six days, and then plus the one day. Actually, not even half. Thirteen days, you can be dropping an additional mech and an additional vehicle, or two additional vehicles. That, that's a pretty significant amount of firepower you can drop, especially if you are going a very tank-heavy strategy. And, especially if you're going very tank-heavy, you don't really need mech tech. Mech tech doesn't really do anything if you're dropping just mostly vehicles. But, all that aside, I still stand by training modules being the best upgrade early on just to get that passive experience rolling in to get your mech warriors better skills faster. Alright, so now that we got that out of the way, on to part two of the episode. So, as I mentioned, we have access to the Carper Heads. I mean, Tandem Rocket 20 is okay, but in isolation with nothing else that does through armor damage, it's kind of whatever. Um, likewise, a Mind Dispenser 20 is okay, but short of anything else, it's kind of whatever. So, I don't think I want to build either of them, but I do definitely want to build the Urban Mech Lamb. In part just to talk about lambs, and in part because, I mean, it's an Irby. Who doesn't love Irbys? So... This Urban Mech Lamb is going to have <laughs> two Weapons Bay Hard Points, three Wing Hard Points, two Ballistic Hard Points, one Energy, and one Support. Pretty good. It's a pretty good little mech. But, since we only have three parts of the Urban Mech Lamb, and we're going to have to combine this part of the Urban Mech R60, when it comes time to ready it up, we have to cobble it together. So. This 18,900 sea bills is specifically for Yang to go to whatever local trash heap, uh, junkyard, or, you know, discount dance to pick up different little components to make the R60 parts fit into the R60 Landmark 2. You now, how similar the two chassis are is what determines how expensive it is. So the fact that it's an Urban Mech R60 and an Urban Mech R60 Lamb makes it much cheaper than if it was, say, an Urban Knight and an Urban Mech R60 Lamb, or whatever. 
Also, the lower the tonnage, usually the cheaper it is, um, with the exception of some like crazy society tech and stuff like that, where it can be like a million sea bills to add a part of whatever. But we're gonna do that, so clicking that, we are now using all three parts of the Urban Mech Lamb to build the Urban Mech Lamb, as well as one part of the Urban Mech R60, and we're gonna confirm. Now then, we're gonna look at this and we're gonna see what do, and also, you know, discuss lambs. Um, because as you'll remember, I mentioned wing hard points, and I mentioned weapons bay hard points, because lambs are special. First things first, Ho! Oh, we actually got the defensive gyro. It is crit. The defensive gyro is crit. However, it is intact. The bad news... Oh, did we actually get the pharaoh and the endo as well? We did. Okay. So, the bad news is we did lose the lamb XL engine, which helps considerably. That's 33% of the engine core tonnage. Which, I mean, for an engine core 120, it's not that big of a deal. That would have only been like a bit over a ton. But if we wanted to put a bigger core in it, that's pretty significant. But uh, we also lost both the lamb turbines that it had, which is unfortunate. Uh, we found the UAC-5. Oh, wow. Okay, so this thing was the one running the UAC-5. That... I would have loved to have had that, but I wouldn't have wanted to run it this early. Because until you have enough gunnery to, at the very least, unjam it in a timely manner, having a ultra auto cannon is just paying a little bit of extra tonnage for a regular auto cannon. Except for those situations where you want to kick it up to times two. In any case. So, heat sinks, I don't care. We, we lost heat sinks, that doesn't matter. The XL engine and the turbines, sad to see them go, but it's fine. And the fact that we saved the ferro aluminum and the endo is kind of nutty, and also means we have the spare ferro aluminum for whenever we find another lamb. Uh, also, we only have one lamb turbine. So, there is an argument to be made for not really using the turbine in isolation just on its own. But we'll get to that in a minute. So, <laughs> the, the first thing to note is everything that you put on a lamb has to be lamb. Uh, this has to be a land air mech armor. This has to be a land air mech structure. You cannot just use regular Indo and still have it be a lamb. Also, the lamb engine has to be a lamb. <laughs> like, you can't use just a regular XL engine in a lamb. But, we also have the lamb flight systems, which just automatically use or provide 1.5 hex jump distance and 30 units walk speed in lamb mode and then also an additional 30 percent jump in lamb mode it's pretty cool <laughs> it's pretty cool and of course i'm pretty sure since there's i think that's two so i it says tonnage zero slots two. And I'm pretty sure that means each one of them is independently giving the 1.5 hex jump distance. Um, it does take one jump jet each, like, cause you can only have four jump jets total on this mech with this, uh, with this engine core. And it does take those slots, but it's very much worth it. I mean, that's, that's 60 extra movement walk speed. So 60, 60 walk, 90 sprint when in lamb mode. Pretty good. And instead of using the turbines, which for one, it, you know, if they get destroyed, it's harder to find replacements. And for two, just using one on its own isn't as effective as using both of them. Actually, that's a question. Can you still, nope. You cannot use regular jump jets with a lamp. So, by not using the turbines, we're basically not going to be able to jump, but that's fine. I don't really care. But we could upgrade the 120 core to something a little bit bigger if we wanted more mobility. Or we could just use it without the extra mobility from a bigger core. In which case, we're still gaining the extra 60 walk, 90 sprint from lamp, from being in lamp mode. 
which is pretty awesome. And you can always you can always swap from land mode to mech mode. Actually, let's look at this. I'm pretty sure this will say it. Yeah, here we go. Land air mech can change between mech and flight mode. Deploys in flight mode. When it's in flight mode, it's unaffected by ground effects and minefields. While in land mode, you get three extra max evasion, but you take 20% additional stability and ten you have a 10% reduced stability threshold. And then if you're in land mode, you can jump plus 70%, which I'm pretty sure stacks additively with the additional 30%, because you can jump insanely far whenever you're in land mode. Basically, you kick on the afterburners and you jet through the sky. Makes sense. But it does generate a very, very large amount of heat. So, we will still have the ability to jump in land mode pretty effectively. And we won't be generating that much extra heat. Like, if we, if we had the land turbines, we could jump much further. But it also generates extra heat per turn. Just period. And then also makes the jumps hotter. So we're giving up a little bit of mobility, we're giving up a little bit of jump distance in exchange for less heat generation from just being a lamb, as well as the extra one ton. And the biggest thing is just if we take damage, if we take crits, if we lose a side torso, we don't have anything super special that we need to replace. So with that out of the way, now that I've spent an extreme amount of time talking about all that, do we even want to use the gyro defense on our lamb? Like, I'm not even joking. Do we just repair it and put it in one of the mediums? That's an interesting consideration. I mean, I'm not going to make it yet. A stealth lamb also sounds pretty fun. <laughs> in any case, in any case, uh, lamb specific stuff. Um, so, just like any other mech, you will have hard points based on, you know, which chassis it is. This one has two ballistics in the arm and one energy in the other arm, as well as one support in the side torso. Just like other mechs, a lamb as far as I know, I have not tested it yet in the handheld rework, but as far as I know, you can at the very least still punch and kick in things in mech mode. You used to be able to punch and kick in things in lamb mode, but I don't know if they uh, changed that at all. Very possible. It, you know, never made a whole ton of sense that a flying mech would fly down and kick you. But, uh, yeah. We'll find that out once we finally field this thing. For now, however, it's going to take us 10 days and just under 200,000 C bills to repair it all the way. So unlike the uh, the other me the medium that we have that we're working on, yeah, we can we can repair this in 10 days and have it ready to equip and then drop. Now, what would we equip it with? We have two wing mount bomb clusters, which I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they take carry capacity, not tonnage. So even aside from whatever weapons we put in the arms, we just have this pair of bomb clusters essentially for free because we don't really have anything else to put on it that takes carry capacity. Or carry weight, I should say. Um, stealth does require one ton of carry capacity for the Stealth X. So we could make a stealth mech a stealth lamb that has the two bomb clusters and the stealth X and still has one additional carry capacity for whatever we ended up using for the weapons bay. Uh, but that would take the two bomb cluster uh, wing mount points on the sides. So we would definitely be on the lookout for at least one more wing mount or weapon bay weapon to take up that last ton after the stealth if we go the stealth path which we might uh but yeah so i'm thinking that's actually basically everything like the the biggest thing whenever it comes to lambs is the mobility side the special equipment side 
and the extra weapon options in the form of wing mount or weapon bay weapons. So, yeah. <laughs> I can't think of anything else to say. But for now, we're definitely not going to put the bomb clusters on. We're going to save the day. We're going to wait. And once we have a better idea of what we have at the time of building the mech, then we'll decide what we're going to do with the carry capacity and the weapon uh, weapon hard points and everything. But yeah, very interesting mech. Um, and that's how you cobble together a mech that you don't have all the pieces you need for. Just pay a little bit to Yang and he finds the parts to make it happen. Now, it is worth noting that not all chassis are compatible with the same, quote, same chassis. Um, there are exceptions. There are some things that are not compatible when they seem like they maybe should be. But I am just going to straight up confirm this. 200,000 C bill is going to a good cause. We'll worry about the uh, repair order in a second. We have 28 days to generate honestly not terribly much 150,000 150,000 from the next mission will definitely cover the financial report will definitely cover our repairs unless we do something very silly yeah looking pretty good but yeah in the uh in storage whenever you click on something do 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 it used to say it probably still does at the very bottom where you can't see it it used to say if you had if you had a uh, chassis that was compatible with another chassis, it would say, you know, this is compatible with that or whatever. But I'm curious if it's maybe at the bottom of the like actuator limits and stuff. I don't know. It used to be there. It does not seem to be there anymore because otherwise it would definitely show for the copperheads. It would show that they're compatible, but um, yeah. You can always click ready to see what parts are available to use. And if you have the parts and you don't want to, after you see how much it's gonna cost or you see what parts you would have to use to build it together, you can always just click cancel. And that brings you right back to the mech bay with all the parts untouched. And obviously you didn't have to pay because you canceled it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's that. I think, yeah, I think I'm going to wait to, I think I'm going to wait to look over the missions and decide repair orders and things. Oh, no, 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 that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had already figured it out. We, we figured it out last time when my brain was still mush. Bushwhacker, three days. Phoenix Hawk, Locust, and Hornet also up in the same three days, and we will be ready to drop. People will be out of fatigue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one, two, three, stop. Ha. Huh. There we go. So, that means we are now ready to drop on this other escort. See, it's all coming back to me now. Drop on this other escort using Horik, Narf, Scion, Rusalka, Sarge, and Tainted Loki. So we've got a full six to drop. It's going to be great. Yeah, Horik is definitely going in the Mockingbird. Tainted Loki is definitely going in his good old Trouser. And then, I'm pretty sure the rest are... Yeah, Scion's Bushwhacker. Narf hasn't dropped yet, so he can just go in whatever. Locust and Phoenix Hawk. Are we really going to put Narf in the Hornet? I mean, he can't pilot vehicles. So... <laughs> That's a... I... I think... I think we do. I think we drop Narf in the Phoenix Hawk and Sarge just loses out on the medium mech and has to drop in the Hornet until we get something better up and running. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, 
I guess I'll just go over it real quick so next episode I can just start in the mission. Um, yeah, it's the escort. I already talked at length about escorts. I just dropped on an escort, like, same biome. I don't know if there's anything else worth saying. This time we're working for planetary government against... Uh, sometimes it's planetary government against planetary government, but... Uh, yeah, no, Republic of the Spear. And this time... Yeah, this time the payoff's actually pretty substantial. Like, as as nice as 627 is... Like, that's that's 180,000. And then, again, if the entire convoy survives... That's an additional 25%. So, the 180,000 quickly becomes... Uh, 225,000 extra. If the entire convoy survives. Alternatively, we could get six more random salvage, or five more random salvage and one more priority pick, which maybe, maybe the random salvage is worth 225,000. I think, honestly, I'm going to look into the Republic of the Sphere, because I'm not super familiar with what tech level they're at. Like, pretty sure they're not periphery. Like, Republic of the Sphere, I'm pretty sure is like, Either Inner Sphere, Noble Houses, or, like, SLDF, Comstar, something like that. Pretty sure they're going to be better than just, like, a periphery state. But especially if they're, like, Comstar, I will definitely 100% be going for full salvage. And I'll just tell you what I did. I, I'm, I'm either going for... <laughs> let me just stutter over everything. I'm definitely going 521 at least... A, in case we get a chance to grab a really cool vehicle. B, because we're looking for a lot of upgrade stuff. We're looking for engine cores. We're looking for uh, we're looking for armor upgrades. We're looking for Indo. We're looking for just all sorts. And then, of course, anything we get randomly. Any weapon systems that we get randomly gives us more options as we build the two new mechs and rebuild the older mechs in the coming financial reports. So yeah, definitely going at least 521. I'll look into it between episodes, or you know, between recordings, and see if uh, <laughs> and see if the Republic of the Spear is worth going all in on salvage. But I'll cover that tomorrow. For now, that's been your episode of Rogue Tech for the day. I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, have a good one.